Hello, ladies and gentlemen. I welcome you all to a brand new episode of Transformation Talks. I am Yasmin Taj, editor, ETHR World International and head branded content at the Economic Times. It is such a pleasure to meet you all once again. For those of you who are new to the Transformation Talks, as part of this LinkedIn Live talk show series, I host global leaders and HR tech influencers from around the globe and urge them to share their experiences from the new world of work that we are all part of through transformation stories about talent, technology, culture, and more. And today, it gives me immense pleasure to host award-winning happiness expert, Jennifer Moss. Jennifer is an award-winning journalist and international public speaker. She is a nationally syndicated radio columnist and author of The Burnout Epidemic and Unlocking Happiness at Work. Jennifer has been named as the International Female Entrepreneur of the Year and recipient of the Public Service Award from the Office of President Obama. So Jennifer, thank you so much for joining us. It is a pleasure to host you today. I'm so thrilled to be here. I'm looking forward to our conversation. Absolutely, and we are looking forward to some great insights coming from you. So, but before we start our conversation, I would also like to give a little brief about the topic we'll be discussing today, Jennifer. Mm -hmm. So in the past couple of years, workplace well-being found new focus for leaders. HR professionals had an added responsibility of ensuring they are taking good care of their workforce in order to not just maintain business productivity, but employee morale too. In this episode today, Jennifer will share her expert opinion on the current trends going around in the workplace regarding well-being and how leaders can ensure their employees thrive in the future world of work. To our audience who are joining this session today, do not forget to post your reflections, views, and comments in the comments section. So Jennifer, jumping right into the first question for you. The world of work is now getting back to normal, but needless to say, the COVID era has been an eye opener for many of us, and these learnings are still worth keeping. What are your primary takeaways from the crisis? Uh, you know, what's interesting is that I think that we're in a paradigm shifting moment. We have, I say, we haven't jumped into the future of work, but the metaverse of work, it's just been this complete sort of overhaul experience. And so this idea of going back to normal, I actually don't want us to go back to normal because the times before weren't really that great for employees. And, you know, I've been shouting about burnout for a long time and it's, it's taken a massive crisis, this cataclysmic moment for people to be thinking about well-being and, and stress and how it impacts the workforce. And so I'm hoping that that shifts and I have seen shifts. I have seen organizations um, spend more, you know, time with their employees to find out what they're feeling, how how they're doing. They're starting to assess and measure well-being and self-reported burnout. They are also starting to invest in more upstream impacts. So for a long time, and this is what you would know that I've been shouting again from the rooftops, is burnout can't be solved with self-care alone. We need a systemic ecosystem approach to it. And so we're seeing that instead of giving a whole bunch of employees you know, ice cream, we're now looking at giving them water. And that is really what they need. They need the sort of the basic stuff, which is teletherapy, um, anonymous uh, ability to have conversations with mental health professionals. We're seeing, you know, more support for conversations around mental health. We're seeing more care leaves and paid family leaves. And these are all upstream interventions. So I'm happy to see that we're maybe taking on a new definition of normal in this next phase post-pandemic workforce. Great, uh, Jennifer, I totally agree with you. I don't think there's a going back to normal anyways. It doesn't seem possible anymore. While we are moving into a hybrid work mode, companies are coming back to the office work model, but remote working will also remain. Flexibility will be a very key component for employees. And as you very rightly said, employees are now looking for the basics and not just ice cream, they need water now. And if organizations can take care of them, that will help them a long way in becoming employers of choice or employees that yeah. care for their employees. And as you very rightly said, the past two, three years have been such an eye opener where the focus on people has become the key priority, not just for HR professionals, but for the entire organization, for business leaders as well. So that has been a great change. The only maybe good thing that came out of the pandemic was that the focus that people had on well-being of people uh, going forward. So thanks, Jennifer. Those were some great thoughts. So we just spoke about how workplace wellness, employee well-being saw its importance grow tenfold during the pandemic. 
Multiple reports have stated that HR and business leaders have been coming with various strategies to plan to, to keep up with the workforce's needs. So Jennifer, what is your take on this and what are some of the strategies that you have been suggesting to employees you regularly interact with? You know, I've been really trying to focus people on going back to the basics. I say grandma's rules, you know, but just, you know, the, the thing that we found actually, and I always think it's important to have data and evidence support the things that are happening in your gut or you feel like are right. And what we continue to see across you know, large um, enterprise to, to startups and small medium business is that when employers had high level of empathy for their team and, um, and there was high trust inside of the organization overall, they fared 10x better than any organization that had uh, were lacking in those areas. So I say go back to those fundamentals. And, um, you know, this is a massive systemic overhaul that we need, yes, but we can control the controllables as leaders. And bit by bit over time, we will make change. That means we need to think about strategies that are more nuanced, more manager direct, you know, manager led, um, giving uh, autonomy to manage for them to be able to, you know, resource as they need, to be able to provide training as they need, to be able to um, support flexibility when it's necessary, to have more non-work related check-ins with their team and, and make sure that they are doing okay, um, having that uh, ability to be vulnerable themselves, to be able to put up their hand and saying, I'm burned out as well. And the more that we can create these sort of small circles of trust and, and empathy that are built Building, we'll start to see a network effect, a sort of contagion effect that happens within organizations. These social contagions actually breed this type of culture that's very healthy. So instead of looking at it at big programmatic changes, the organizations that are doing well are looking at it in these small pockets of trial and error, being very agile, not being married to our um, plans and seeing how people feel and asking along the way. That's active listening. And that's what's actually gonna contribute, I think, to the real change over time. Uh, I absolutely agree. I think, yes, it is about going back to the fundamentals, making change happen at smaller levels first, and then have, you know, making sure that the contagion effect, as you very rightly said, is impacting the overall performance, not just of your employees, but also of your business, right? Business leaders, HR leaders have to take care of both the ends, the employee side of it, the business side of it. So how do you bring them together? How do you take care of the basics, the fundamentals of employee experience, of employee well-being? Make sure you're listening to people. Very beautifully, you, you said that. It's about understanding the needs and then working on an organizational culture that enables and empowers employees to bring their best selves to work and be more productive and, you know, work in a way as they want and as works best for them. Yes, and, the, and I, I love what you're saying because you're right that there is this, you know, this pressure on all sides to still meet shareholder demands and stakeholder demands and market growth and we don't want to make it so that um, that there is no give and take, that this isn't a reciprocal relationship. But what we always see from the data is that the healthier, more well employees are, the more productive, the more engaged, the, you know, the higher revenue. I mean, all of those other metrics come downstream. And sometimes we just want to have instant gratification. So it's like, let's press as hard as we can to get the most out of that person. And what happens is that it ends up that we make it not sustainable sustainable. So they can only produce for so much amount of time and they're not actually getting what they, they need and they can't produce in the same way. So if we look at it as both, you know, both and, you know, we are going to be able to have both a healthy, well, you know, um, happy employee, and we're going to have a successful organization. And those two go hand in hand. Absolutely agree with you. I think that is the thing that's about the balance. And you were, and another beautiful thought that I now resonate with more is about talking about your own vulnerability as leaders. I think that is also going to go a long way in how your organization, how your people perceive you. If you give them, show them that side of you, they see that and that's how they reciprocate as you very rightly said. So thanks for sharing that, Jennifer. Uh, coming to your book, uh, you've spoken the Unlocking Happiness at Work, Jennifer. Uh, in it, you've debunked a myth that happiness at work is a waste of time and how it can deliver a more productive and engaged workforce according to you why and how leaders can leaders become compassionate capitalists and ensure that their teams thrive 
Well, I, I've been really um, passionate about the idea of compassionate capitalism. And I think the reason for that is that what, you know, what we've found in this last couple of years with overwork, unsustainable workloads, um, real disproportionate impact on women, for example, in this in this last you know couple of years, they're exiting the workforce. There's just been a lot of of impact, a, a sort of an explosion of things that were already going wrong, and we've lost this sort of inspiration, this connection to the mission and the goals of our organization, and that mismatch values is one of the root causes of the six root causes of burnout. And so, what we need to start understanding is that if we can create um, more inspired workforces, if we are doing good and and with that good, you know, we're we're contributing to the community that we live in or we're contributing to the to the global experience, then people get behind that. Em employees feel excited by that. They feel energized by that. And we need to figure out what it is that makes our team tick. What is it that we can make exciting for them and they can get behind? Because when there is a values mismatch and we're not feeling passionate, we feel extraordinarily ineffective. We're not feeling like what we do matters. We don't feel like the, that it's valued or we're, we're valuable. And the more that we can integrate this sense of compassionate capitalism, the more likely that we're going to see that inspiration, which reduces burnout, but also leads to, to lots of metrics of success. Thanks. Thanks for sharing that, Jennifer. I totally agree with you again. I think uh, it is about inspiring people to do better, creating, enabling them with that environment by changing the basics of what is working for them, understanding that better. I think this is what will create. So happiness at work might not be true for everybody. And yes, but inspiring people to bring their best selves to work is something that organizations can work towards to build a more productive and engaged workforce. So thank you for sharing that. Uh, coming to your next book, which is the more recent one, this is the, the Burnout Epidemic. It discusses the causes of burnout, and you just spoke a lot about how burnout is causing, there's a mismatch of values, there's a mismatch of what's happening, and, and people, be it leaders or be it your employees, are suffering different sorts of burnout at different stages of their careers. So how do you think an organization stop this chronic stress cycle that an alarming number of workers are suffering from right now? Can you tell us more about that, Jennifer? Yes. And, you know, I was in an interview yesterday and what someone, uh, they said 30 seconds, can you answer what, you know, how we're going to solve for this? And I thought, you know, that's impossible. There's, you know, there's so much that is at play here, all the way from systemic discrimination to, you know, that lack of fairness, the isolation and loneliness that has been plaguing, you know, our, our world, our globe right now. And this is, this, these are things that are sort of intangible. So, it's not like every organization has that power or every manager has that power. And certainly employees don't have the, the privilege to be able to make those choices either. So it really is about understanding that we have to, um, you know, we have to embrace this concept of, of happiness and wellness as not being something that is, you know, is icky or, you know, not serious or fluffy or soft. Social, emotional intelligence and psychological fitness fitness inside of an organization is a hard skill to build. You know, in the U.S. military, you know, leadership guidebook, they actually put empathy as the number one skill for leaders. And, you know, we don't look to the military in our world as being um, soft. So that needs to be a priority. We need to focus more on, on understanding that that's a really big priority. And then recognizing that the way that we're going to deal with chronic stress is by actively listening and measuring. And I'm a big fan of, of data. And a lot of people, you know, will be like, oh, you know, we do these, you know, employee surveys and very few people answer. And if they do, you know, it's, it doesn't, it's not that great. They hate doing it. I'm not talking about a massive, you know, across the board, uh, looking back survey where you get data a year later and who knows what that actually means because it's not addressing what's happening now. I'm talking about each manager, you know, doing one intervention, testing non-work related check-ins, er, check testing, meeting guidelines, reducing meetings, 
testing, you know, something that is really important to your staff, what people need, implementing that. And before you implement it, ask, what is your self-reported burnout? Like, how are you feeling T task? If they're exhausted and, and less effective and cynical, those three questions, you know, post intervention and see if anything's changed. Spend a month focused on one little tiny tactic that you've tried to implement to improve the team and see if it works. And if people aren't moving the needle and they still seem stressed out, find another, you know, tactic and measure that. And, and bit by bit, we'll get to this kind of, you know, place where it's a Goldilocks zone where we're doing our best and people are responding and then they're getting, you're getting feedback and they're getting feedback. And that's how we move the needle is just asking, you know, testing, iterating, and then, you know, reproducing the next, you know, the next activity, very much like a productization or an agile way of leading. And that's what I think we need to start thinking about more in all industries and not just tech, how they are, you know, have been really good at it so far. Yeah, I think that's, again, a great thought, Jennifer. Firstly, uh, when you spoke about how empathy is so important, no matter what uh, kind of an industry you're working, what kind of a role you are at, if you're if you're managing people, you need to know what empathy means and how do you practice it in, on a, in a daily way. Secondly, again, you spoke about listening to employees, testing what's working for them. How do you listen and how do you test what what work works for them and how do you reiterate that in in, in your day to day function? So again, company wide surveys. I don't think that they work at all. Too. It is about going bit by bit, starting small in pockets, understanding that, and then understand, you know create then finding out the ultimate solution that works for your people. Burnout will happen burnout will remain the future of work may be even more stressful we do not know yet right but how if organizations and if leaders and managers can just have these human trend uh, these human behaviors i think that's going to go a long way so thank you so much for sharing that again it's you're right it's just it's being a human being and we've been transactional in our workforces for a really long time it's just come into work you get paid you go home you know, and that's the relationship, but our social contract with work has fundamentally changed and our employers are asking us to do more at different times of the day. They're part of our lives. And, and I don't agree that that's, that's the, the right way to prevent burnout. We need to have guidelines around that, but you know, we, they can't just expect to ask that and not have us you know, a demand it's something in return. And that means you need to be able to, you know, be a human being, you need to care. And when you look at this last data, 41% of the global workforce looking at quitting in the next three months, um, what they found was that lack of empathy, lack of caring and overwork were the two top reasons. And you know, we used to not want our employers to be in our business. And I think that there is this kind of balance between that, but we do want them to care about who we are and our well-being. And, and if we're, you know, surviving work, because we should be flourishing at work, we should not be just surviving it. Uh, that's a lovely thought. Exactly. We should be flourishing at work and not just surviving. I think that's what the whole, this whole wave of the great resignation actually spoke. It, it, it was such a, a mm -hmm. shocker. It was, it was an eye opener for organizations to so understand, yeah. okay, things are not really going right. So we need to focus on, on our people even more. So I think that's been great. So thank you so much for sharing that, Jennifer. We spoke a lot about how Again, the world of work has changed. It's uh, there's remote working, there's hybrid working happening, and yes, technology tools. It, this, these things will play a big role in our everyday lives as well as at the way we work. You know, in creating the right balance between providing flexible work options without the risk of leading to exhaustion and burnout. So, technology is going to be a huge ally in that. So, what suggestions do you have, Jennifer, for companies on having the right digital solutions when we talk about the future of work? I love that you asked that because I think, you know, I really believe in the dialectical theory of opposites and I'll explain that it's basically like two things can be true at the same time and technology and in the pandemic has had two roles. It's, it's been there to really facilitate this flexibility and this capacity for us to go from 4% of the global workforce working remote to 35% over two weeks. I mean, that is dramatic. You imagine hundreds of millions of people going remote and being able to do that. Yeah, there was a learning curve. There was some pivoting that had to happen, but it happened because of technology, which is profoundly exciting. However, it's burning us out. The amount of time that we're on, you know, our technology 
it's not healthy. And so how do we have these two things where it's, where it's, we're focusing on it being more transformational than exhausting. And a big part of that is that we are over looping and over collaborating right now. Recent, you know, Microsoft trends data showed that meetings have increased by 252%. I mean, that's just astronomical. And we were already dealing with meeting fatigue beforehand. So we've got meeting fatigue and now we've got meeting exhaustion. So it's about, you know, being better about giving permission to people to politely decline, you know, being on meetings, getting away from video conferencing as much as we're on it, use other, you know, modes of communicating social collaboration platforms, get on a good old fashioned cell phone and use that. It's still a really help, you know, helpful technology, you know, meet in person, go analog at times where we're getting, you know, we're sitting at desks or we're commuting into work and then we're just sitting on Zoom meetings. We, we should really actually use the hybrid sort of way of working differently. Again, paradigm shifting. It isn't about going and doing the same things that you would at work anymore. It should be about team building, bonding, you know, maybe it's work sprints, whatever it is, but we should be spending it together in a different and unique way now. So figuring out how to reduce the amount of time we are on technology. So it, it provides that same novelty and productivity that we need. And then figuring out what is the balance of being still looking at each other eye to eye, in person, connecting, in a meaningful way so that we can use technology to augment our relationships and not completely replace them. Um, we're seeing that's actually playing a huge role, especially in our younger workforce demographic. They're really feeling atrophied right now because they aren't getting that time with their boss or their coworkers. So we need to get that there's nuances in different demographics. You know, some people really like the flexibility, but some people really do need face-to-face -face and figuring that out through asking, you know, learning and actioning. Exactly, exactly. So I, I do believe that yes, technology can be a double edged sword at times. It has a lot of pluses, but yes, it become can lead to a lot of it, it can be overwhelming, right? For people, there's so much out there in your personal lives, your professional lives, there's technology everywhere. And that can actually overwhelm people and they do not know how to manage it. And it leads to a lot of fatigue and burnout eventually. So to, in order to make technology your ally, you have to know the right tools, as you said, as what works for people and what doesn't, and then apply and implement technology in a way that is uh, uh, I think that, as you said, that helps people flourish at work rather than just be just, just support them in the workforce. So thanks, thanks, Jennifer, for sharing that. Uh, moving on to our concluding question for this uh, interview, Jennifer, uh, you are a workplace and wellness and burnout expert. So what will be your three golden tips for our hybrid leaders of today so that they ensure they maintain a healthy and happy work culture for their workforce? Well, I mentioned a couple. I would definitely say that we change the way that we're meeting and, and we're collaborating and, and sort of think strategically about what hybrid really looks like for you and your team. It's going to look different for everyone. And hybrid, we've sort of, you know, one company has declared it looks like this. And so we followed suit. Let's figure out what, it, what works for us and, and understand that what, what I highly recommend is for you to, to utilize this opportunity, not to waste a crisis, you know, don't just go back, you know, figure out a transformational way to really improve the workforce. And that means, you know, um, making sure that there's more fun, you know, we need more serendipitous moments. And when we are working remotely or we're really overworked, we don't have time for that levity or friendships or relationships. And I actually think that that's the biggest threat to organizations right now. And they're not seeing it the friendship productive relationship piece. We're really excited about this flexibility. And a lot of employees are saying, I'll quit if I have to go back to in-person. But I think there's a way to get people to be in person in a fun, healthy way. And the reason they don't want to go back to work is because you're, again, you're commuting in just so that you can be on Zoom. Don't use your time like that in that way. Um, and so figuring out how to make that work will be the most, I think, fundamental. I also think we need to make sure that we set really good guidelines as, as leaders around when people can disconnect. And managers need to 
really model the behavior of self-care and these restrictions on themselves because it creates a lot of invisible pressure when you say, don't answer your emails in the evenings or on weekends or on vacation, but I'm going to do it. But just ignore that because, you know, I'm your manager. I'm supposed to do that. That doesn't really actually change anything. We need to change legacy. So managers, you need to be better and leaders better at self-care and walking the talk. And I think, you know, the third piece is that we are over collaborating. And I said, we need to make sure that we are letting people off the hook for, you know, for being in meetings and we need to be able to politely decline meetings, but create way better guidelines around that. Tell people that they can have meetingless days, you know, and, and make sure that's really prioritized, making sure that certain types of meetings don't happen on Friday at three o'clock in the afternoon, you know, making sure that you're auditing how many people and the expense of going over, making sure there's not time theft and there's more etiquette around people spending in these meetings, making sure that you are very good at setting agendas. So if there's someone that isn't needed until 1045 and they only are, need to be there for the last 15 minutes of the meeting, invite them for 1045. I mean, creating better ways of respecting people's time is how we're going to reduce burnout. So those are my three sort of big starting points, small tactics, easy to operationalize, but just this is how we can get the ball rolling. Wow. Wow, Jennifer. I think the bottom line is if we, are, if we have a head and a heart at the right place, if we are empathetic to our people and their needs, if we take care of how they work, when they work, how better they can work with the kind of technology and the opportunities available to them, give them the flexibility, listen to them, you know, inspire them to talk more and share what is working for them. And, and then, as you said, test what is working, reiterate that, work on those policies and initiatives to create better working environments for your people, be more human, be more empathetic. You will create a more engaged and productive and, and, uh, and inspire your workforce to bring their best selves to work. So I could go on talking about this, Jennifer. It's a very, very, very exciting topic, but thank you so much for your time. It was such a pleasure talking to you today. Oh, it was such a wonderful conversation, lots of quality content and just a, like a, such a short amount of time. I feel like we could go on forever, but thank you so much for inviting me. This was great. Absolutely. I think if you want to make happier workplaces, we need to focus on our people, become better leaders, become more empathetic, listen and respond at the end of it. So that's going to go a long way in the future. So thank you, Jennifer, once again. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, simple, simple, simple. We don't need to complicate it. Let's just go back to, uh, to what we were taught growing up and put that back into the workplace right now. Exactly. Let's go back to the basics. Thank you. So thank you, Jennifer, once again. Yeah. It was a wonderful conversation and uh, it was a pleasure hosting everyone watching this episode today. Please stay tuned for the next episode of Transformation Talks. See you all super soon. Take care until then and bye-bye.